Hey guys, if you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. It's free. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast from your phone or your computer, and it will even distribute your podcast for you. So it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and so many more. And you can make money from your podcast with starting with your first episode. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. This week's case is about Marianne Parker. Frances Marianne Parker, also known as Marianne, was born on October 11, 1915 in Los Angeles, California, to Geraldine Heisel and Perry Parker. They had a brother named Barry Jr., who was 18 years old, and a twin sister named Marjorie. On December 15, 1927, a well-dressed young man came into the registrar's office of 12-year-old Marianne's school, Mount Vernon Junior High, and introduced himself to Mary Holt and Naomi Flint as Mr. Cooper. Mr. Cooper told Mary that his boss, Perry, had been in an accident and was asking to see his daughter right away. Mary was confused and asked him which daughter. This man was apparently unaware that Marianne was a twin. He answered, Mary Ann. Mr. Cooper then told Mary that she could call the bank to confirm that he was an employee there. No more further questions were asked, and Mary Ann was then pulled out of class, and both Mary Ann and the stranger were able to leave. They got into his car, which was a coupe, and they drove away. Geraldine became extremely worried when Marjorie returned home after school without Mary Ann. Geraldine then proceeded to call Mary Ann's classmates and friends to ask if they knew where her daughter was, but none of them had seen her. Where he turned into straight up fear when Perry received a telegram from Pasadena. It read, Do positively nothing until you receive special delivery letter, and it was signed Marianne Parker. A second telegram arrived shortly after, and it read, Marianne secure, use good judgment, interference with my plans dangerous, and it was signed the Fox. Perry contacted Marianne's school, and they told him about Mr. Cooper. After hanging up at the school, he contacted the police and reported that his daughter had been kidnapped. Mary Holt was quoted during the trial as saying, quote, I never would have let Marianne go, but for the apparent sincerity and disarming manner of the man, end quote. Perry and Geraldine gave the description of Marianne to the police. She was four foot six and 100 pounds. She was wearing an English dress, brown Oxford shoes, and tan stockings. Her hair was straight black and cut into a bob just above her jaw, and she looks like Marjorie. The man's description was given to the police by Mary and Naomi. He was described as a white male between the ages of 25 and 30 years old. His height is 5 foot 8 and weighing 150 pounds. He was wearing a heavy grayish brown overcoat, black shoes, and a dark hat. Both Mary Ann and the kidnapper's description were also given to the press. As the police searched for hours for Marianne and her abductor, the search had sadly turned up nothing. On December 16th, the Parkers received another ransom note demanding that they send him $15,000 in gold certificates, which is a little more than $22,000 in today's time. For Marianne's safe return, and it was signed, Death. The Parker family received two more letters like this, signed with different names, such as Fate and the Fox. On the night of December 16th, a letter with directions on it was sent to Perry, telling him to deliver the money at 10th Street and Great Mercy Place. Sadly, the police had been watching the Parker home. They saw Perry leave and followed him to the location. The kidnapper saw the police car and fled. On December 17th, the kidnapper had sent two more letters after the police interfered with the exchange. The first read, get this straight, your daughter's life hangs by a thread and I have a guillotine ready and able to handle this situation. The second one gave Perry instructions to wait by the telephone and was warned not to let the police interfere. At 6.35 p.m., Perry finally received the phone call and was given the location. Perry arrived at West 5th Street and Manhattan Place at 8 p.m. and waited for the kidnapper. A Chrysler coupe pulled up next to Perry, and the driver was wearing a bandana to disguise his face and pointed a gun at Perry and said, quote, You know what I'm here for, no monkey business, end quote. 
Perry asked to see his daughter, and the kidnapper pointed at the passenger seat. When he looked at Mary Ann, she was slumped over, bundled up with blankets, and her eyes were wide open. The kidnapper told Perry that she was asleep, so Perry assumed she had been chloroformed. After Perry handed the gold certificates to the kidnapper, the kidnapper then drove up 200 feet to 432 Manhattan Place and pushed Mary Ann out into the curb and drove away. Perry then got out of the car, ran over to his daughter, and as he was cradling her, he noticed that she was pale. Once the bundle of blankets were removed, Perry discovered she had been decapitated, dismembered, and disemboweled. An autopsy was performed, and it was determined that she had been dead for 12 hours. There was no sign of sexual assault or drugs in the girl's system. The cause of death couldn't be determined and was thought to have been asphyxiation or blood loss. The girl's limbs had been severed right at where the limbs meet the body. Her organs had been removed and her tor lower torso had been stuffed with towels. There was a wire that was wrapped so tightly around her head above the eyes that they left a gaping wound. Her eyes had been sewn open with piano wire to make her appear alive. On December 18th, Marianne's limbs and organs had been found. They were put in bundles of newspaper and secured with twine and dumped at a lazy park. That same day, a woman found a suitcase in the front of her lawn at 620 Manhattan Street. Inside, the killer had put blood-soaked towels and the same twine that was used to sew open Marianne's eyes. The unsettling detail of Marianne's death was leaked to newspapers. This horrified and enraged everyone in Los Angeles. A nationwide manhunt of 20,000 people was initiated by police to find Marianne's killer, and a $100,000 reward was offered for his ID and capture. <laughs> Innocent people were being arrested or hurt because they were suspected by citizens of being the killer. One man was arrested seven times in one day because he matched the description of the killer. Another man was beaten by an angry mob because they thought he might have been the killer. One of the towels that had been stuffed in Marianne's abdomen had a watermark and it was finally identified by police. It was traced back to the Bolivar Arms apartment room number 315. Police then went to the apartment to investigate. A man named Donald Evans lived there in that apartment and matched the description of Mary Ann's kidnapper. No evidence was found in the apartment, so the police left, and shortly after, Evans fled. On December 20th, the police finally got their major breakthrough. They found the abandoned getaway car. It had been reported stolen two weeks before from San Diego. The fingerprints that were found on the vehicle were taken in, and not long after, the police got their match on the fingerprints. The fingerprints belonged to 19-year-old William Edward Hickman. Hickman had been a former employee with Perry Parker at First National Bank. Hickman had worked there before he was caught with $400 worth of stolen and forged checks. Hickman was arrested and then released on probation. He then moved in with family in Missouri for six months, before moving back to Los Angeles. Hickman had moved into the Belvedere Arms Hotel under the false name of Donald Evans. The police went back to search Evans' abandoned apartment again, and they found bloody footprints, partial burnt letters that looked like drafts of the ransom letters he had sent to the Parker family, and clippings, clippings of the crime. A janitor also witnessed on the night of the 16th, Evans was carrying several bundles out to his car, and then the next day he was cleaning the seats. On December 20th, a man matching Hickman's description was reported to have stolen a green Hudson around 6.30 in the morning. Hickman was spotted at, at a gas station in Portland by an attendant named Fred King on December 22nd. Fred King contacted the police and said that Hickman was heading in the direction of the Columbia River, River Gorge. A bulletin was posted and the police were stationed on every road leading out of Portland. At 1.30 p.m., Ton Garand and Buck Lou Allen found Hickman on Echo, Oregon. Hickman was driving the stolen vehicle down an old Oregon Trail road. The police followed him for about two miles before he pulled over and surrendered. While in jail in Echo, Oregon, Hickman asked if he might get as much publicity as Leopold and Leope. They were arrested and tried for kidnapping and murdering a 14-year-old boy named Bobby Franks. 
Hickman made a confession to the reporters stating that he made the phone calls and wrote the ransom letters, but he was just an accomplice to two Kramer, to the two Kramer brothers, and they were the ones who murdered Marianne. These allegations were proven to be false because the brothers had been incarcerated for months. Hickman knew the Kramer brothers through one of their girlfriends. Hickman knew of their criminal history and tried to implicate them for the crime. Hickman was then sent back to Los Angeles, and while there, he confessed to another murder he committed during a holdup at a drugstore a few years earlier, and many other armed robberies. Police were able to get Hickman to confess to Marianne's murder after a couple days. He stated that he had no intention of killing her, but the, the decision came on suddenly. Hickman confessed that he had Marianne blindfolded and tied to a chair. He strangled her with a towel, and then he undressed her and took her to the bathtub. He then hung her upside down and cut a hole in her jugular vein and then dismembered and disemboweled her. He said her body jerked and she flew out of the tub, insinuating that she was alive and that when this was happening. He went and saw a movie after wrapping her limbs and organs in newspaper. Hickman put her head and torso in a suitcase and put it in his car. Hickman came back early from the movie because he couldn't concentrate. Hickman said that he tied the wire around the girl's head and wrapped her up in a blanket because he realized that her father might want to see her before paying the ransom. In late January of 1928, William's murder trial began. Hickman pled not guilty for reasons of insanity. There was evidence proven against him when a guard of the Oregon jail testified that he asked how to, quote, act crazy, end quote. After 10 days, the jury deemed him sane and he was sentenced to death by hanging. William Hickman never showed any remorse for what he did. The only concern that he had was how he was going to be buried. William Hickman was sent to the gallows on October 19, 1928. While falling through the doors of the gallows, Hickman struck his head. A witness stated it took two minutes for him to die. An autopsy was performed and it showed that William Hickman's neck didn't break during the hanging and that he had died from asphyxiation. And there you have the facts. Thank you again for a moment of your time for listening to this case. I will see you guys next time.